Who the fuck goes to Mexico in their 70s to go and die in a revolution? Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Happy birthday, Nicholas Carlucci. Wishing you and your family all the best, and I hope you have a great day, man. Nicholas is an awesome friend and patron, so happy birthday, man. I think Sarah Michelle picked up this book for you, huh? Hope you enjoy it. Today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial. It's got a cash clip on the back, which is pretty rad, and it holds up to 12 cards, which is great. And it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty snazzy, I gotta say. I love these things. They've, they're just like super, super handy. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 90s and they need to get with it. I'm not, I'm not a crazy big advocate of new technology like all the time, but this is an area where I appreciate development and progress, you know? This is efficient, it's minimalist, it's easy to use, it's practical, and it's kind of just awesome looking. And it's sturdy. This is the one I've been carrying around for nearly a year, and it's uh, maybe more actually, and it's it's been great. I've really, really enjoyed this. It doesn't fold or awkwardly bulge in your back pocket. I never worry about my wallet anymore. It's great. Never lost it. Never. This one here is the Stonewashed Titanium. I really like the uh, distressed industrial texture. If you prefer something else though, there's over 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. In fact, the Rich team is so confident you'll like it, you can test drive it for 45 days and send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. That wasn't enough to win you over yet? Check out the 30,000 five-star reviews. 30,000, incredible. Get 10% off your order today with free worldwide shipping returns by going to rich.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thank you for your consideration. Also, these bookmarks are available for $4 each plus shipping. It's just my face with a little reminder. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can hit me up by the email or Instagram down below. I'll send you a quote and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Also, this review is ad free on Patreon for patrons. So if you would like to follow the link below, you can donate a dollar or more and get this review with no ads and all forthcoming reviews as well. So thanks a bunch. All right, today I am reviewing Gringo Viejo or The Old Gringo by Carlos Fuentes. Pretty rad cover there. In October 1913, and by then in his 70s, and having made the decision to become involved in the Mexican Revolution, the American horror author uh, and journalist Ambrose Bierce wrote this in a letter to his niece. Goodbye. If you hear of my being stood up against a Mexican stone wall and shot to rags, please know that I think that a pretty good way to depart this life. It beats old age, disease, or falling down the cellar stairs. To be a gringo in Mexico, ah, that is euthanasia. Subtle he was not, funny he was. This is a brilliant, brilliant idea for a novel. Uh, the Old Gringo is a fictional account of the last days of Ambrose Bierce, the American horror author and journalist, who, yeah, decided in his 70s to travel down to the border uh, across from El Paso and, uh, and, and eventually join the revolution to fight in Pancho Villa's Mexican Revolution. So he went down there and he, he did, and he disappeared. He, he was never heard from again. But the novel is also in a grander way, I think a, a dark commentary on how history uh, uh, repeats or echoes itself from the micro family structure to the macro cultural country governmental structure. Uh, it's also a book about identity and, uh, and loneliness, feeling deeply out of place, deeply, deeply out of one's depth, but in, and you know, also changing. It really shows that it's never too late to have kind of like a radical shift, a radical shakeup in one's uh, constitution, existential constitution kind of. And it's a book about death. It's a book about dying. And what the right way to die is from person to person and uh, what's worth dying for. So it's a big book in a way, even though it's, a, it's just a hair under 200 pages. I wouldn't call it a short read. The first half is actually, it, it, it kind of um, moves a lot faster than the second half I noticed, or maybe the first two thirds or something like that. It's almost as if the paragraphs kind of like uh, really uh, filled in by the end. Like it really got quite, um, yeah, kind of intense. The pace for me really slowed down. I really got kind of, maybe mired is the wrong word, but, but pretty close, you know? So yeah, it starts with Bierce, Ambrose Bierce, arriving in Mexico on horseback with a suitcase containing very little and uh, three books in it, two of them by him. Uh, the third one is, is Don Quixote by Cervantes, which he's always wanted to read. He gets very upset if he uh, cuts himself shaving. He's quite concerned with his image because he wants to make a beautiful corpse. 
Yeah. He wants Pancho Villa himself to give him the coup de grace, which, uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that is the final shot to the head of a dying person or animal. That is the, that is the mercy shot in the head. The coup de grace. What uh, drives a man to go and do this, you know? What indeed? It's a terrific starting place for a novel. I mean, if, you, if you've ever read the short stories of Ambrose Bierce, they're great. He was known while alive as a bitter Bierce, working as a journalist for the paper for, uh, for William Randolph Hearst. I think he was a columnist. Hearst was the, the newspaper tycoon of which uh, Citizen King was based on. Bierce had a reputation as kind of a tough, callous critic, like a real cynical bastard, but also kind of brilliant and witty, totally irreverent. He was a lieutenant in the, uh, the Civil War. He was in the Union. I struggle to think of like authors who were more of a tough son of a bitch. And there's the Hemingway thing and all that. And, but uh, who the fuck goes to Mexico in their 70s to go and die in a revolution? Even though the novel is good and the writing is good and everything and Fuentes is, is a great author, that is the best part of the story already. <laughs> you know, I hate to say it. That's, that's the most intriguing idea in the whole narrative, the motivation behind Bierce. And that is a true story. So, so it's, it's excellent that I think. But apparently there have been a lot of books written about uh, the fate of Ambrose Bierce, or, or at least ones where he's, he's been a fictional character. So I think his background at this point in his life is, is uh, important because you know, two of his sons are dead. I think one of them from alcoholism and the other one from suicide. I could be wrong about that. And then his, his daughter uh, refuses to talk to him. She, won't, she says she'll never see him again or something like that, at least in the book. And I think his wife is long gone at this point. So he's not leaving anything, really. As it says in the book, he's heading towards the last frontier, right? Which is the one inside himself. Now he was sure. Each of us has a secret frontier within him. And that is the most difficult frontier to cross because each of us hopes to find himself alone there but finds only that he is more than ever in the company of others. Bierce wrote a short story called An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge about a man being hanged by Union soldiers who escapes, in a manner of speaking. And I'll leave it at that. It's an excellent short story if memory serves. And uh, there's, there's a terrific um, short film adaptation as well, which you can probably find on YouTube. Very, very good, very memorable, uh, excellent. Excellent short story, excellent film, I highly recommend that. But it's all about a man and his death which is what the book is about. It's about men and their death. It's not entirely true though, because I mean, the protagonist is actually, the, the, the person I think who, who we're getting the book through is um, uh, Harriet Winslow, female character, the female protagonist in the book, but specifically Bierce's death. So yes, he's come to Mexico under the thin pretense of fighting in Pancho Villa's revolution, but, but what he's really come to do, and the Mexicans who he meets know it, uh, is die in a way that suits him. In your own life, if you find the right way to die, then you'll find the right way to live. And you can quote me on that. It's a bit of a morbid exercise, I know, but you know, while I was reading, I, I thought about this. And uh, I think it's actually potentially a, a tremendously uh, positive and, and useful exercise because it really gives you that autonomy, you know, because it really allows you to decide what you want in and out of life by deciding where, when, and how you would prefer your inevitable end to be. Now, maybe it's just tremendously positive for somebody like a type A, hello, for, for a control freak, basically. I mean, you could discover quite a bit about yourself and your own thoughts, desires, and ultimately the meaning of your life, no? Just something to meditate on if you're interested. Back to the old gringo. So Beers arrives in Mexico and he meets this self-appointed general, uh, this young guy, working under Pancho Villa named Tomas Arroyo. He lives in this train car that's been uh, kind of like decorated in this kind of luxurious fashion. It's weird. So Beers wants to sign up. And uh, Arroyo is skeptical, of course. He's like, what is going on with this dude? So he pulls out a silver peso, right? And he flips it. And Bierce pulls out a Colt 44 and shoots a hole right through it. He was the first lieutenant in the Civil War, after all. You know, he's, he's hard shit. He's a tough son of a bitch. <laughs> you know, those are back in the days of like duels and shit, right? You know, so like, if you were like insulting people in papers, you have to like take that into account. Like that was probably like a risky thing. Like you would have had to have been one tough motherfucker to like say that kind of shit in public because I mean, people would want to kill you. I mean, and they probably could and get away with it. I mean, Hearst, I think actually it's speculated actually did murder somebody once on a boat, but I don't know if that's true or not. Fighting words were actually fighting words. You could die. The, there was actual risk to life and limb. Like people were not fucking around. There wasn't any of this Twitter shit back then. There wasn't any of this like 
namby pamby fucking garbage. Like you could fucking die. So all I mean to say is that it, it brings it into a whole new light when you realize that that was his job. Like after killing people in the army, his job was killing people in the newspapers with actual risk. And then, but then he was also like this brilliant writer at the same time. So it's like, that guy was pretty cool. So he joins up, right? Because I mean, like they have like this gringo who's like a superpower, like he just wants to die. So he just doesn't care. So, so he's behaving in ways where he's not trying to save his own ass. He's, he's riding on his horse in front of everybody towards the bullets. He doesn't care. And he lives, right? Of course. Beers does stuff like riding into the enemy's gunfire on horseback as if to just try and get himself killed. Because I mean, he is. He's braver than any of the other men because he doesn't want to live. He has come to Mexico to die. Great premise. Meanwhile, uh, after they take over this large estate, um, this hacienda, which is actually the home of and kind of dark origin of Tomas Arroyo. They meet a gringa who's come there named uh, Harriet Winslow. She's come to Mexico as well from Washington. Uh, she's arrived at this estate to, because she was hired to teach the, the children who live there. Uh, but when she arrives to this estate, uh, they've already cleared out because of the revolution. So she arrives to this empty estate and now it's under siege and Arroyo's men are just like destroying it. Arroyo, it's a caffeine, I can't, can't get my R's. Harriet Winslow is actually the main character of the story, though it does travel from person to person in this kind of triangle. But, but I believe she's actually sort of the one who the story is told, who, whose point of view the story is told from, I think. It is, it is a little confusing because it seems like a straight narrative at first, not first person, like thir third person omniscient, uh, but then it kind of um, sinks in and out of thoughts and uh, memories and it shifts from places in time and different voices. I mean, it's not as confusing as um, Faulkner or uh, Virginia Woolf uh, uh, to the lighthouse, which I read not too long ago, but it is definitely inspired by Faulkner, uh, definitely inspired by As I Lay Dying and uh, uh, The Sound of the Fury, all of, all of them, I imagine, because uh, Fuentes was a big Faulkner fan because Faulkner is basically the, the fucking best. So, so Harriet and Beers have something in common. I mean, obviously, I mean, they're both these gringos from America. And Harriet kind of falls in love both with uh, the old gringo, but also with Tomas. And there's a lot going on in these relationships, which Fuentes dives into. Harriet's relationship with her father, Beerus's relationship with his family, Arroyo's relationship with the revolution, with, with himself as, you know, what he's trying to accomplish for Mexico, but also for himself, it seems. His own demons, you know, the trauma of his origin. The Mirandas, which were this, uh, they sound like wealthy, contemptible characters uh, who exploited the people who worked on the hacienda and who, who lived there with them and were cruel and the men were rapists. Bad folks who abused the people who worked for them, who abused the lower class, exploited them uh, sexually and, and for labor. Nasty bourgeois assholes, basically. He was actually the product of one of these rapes on the hacienda, so very, very dark story. Harriet's relationship with her father who disappeared in the Spanish-American war in Cuba and who ran off with a woman over there uh, and abandoned her and her, her mother, essentially, although they, they took the pension that came from that. And also Harriet's husband, who was a crook, basically. And then also uh, what's brought up um, in all of them, I think, is, is the relationship between Mexico and the United States. The idea of being a person from a certain place uh, on a certain side. There, there was one, one point where um, somebody, I forget the context of the scene in the book, but they, they describe the border, it's not a line, through the uh, through the earth, which which is the border of the U.S. and Mexico, it's a scar. That's interesting. I thought that was a compelling way to put it. Ultimately, it's a story about two men who want to die and a woman who wants to escape, but falls in love with both of them. Although with you know with uh, with with Beerus, it's more of kind of it seems more of like a paternal thing. But I think you have a really strong uh, feminine point of view in this, contrasted with the uh, the masculine. He really dives into everybody's history and perspective, it seems. And you have a rich tapestry of reflection and confusion and lust and hatred and shame and existential struggle in one of the harshest environments I could think of. A lot of it is about loneliness, you know? That's the feeling I get, at least. This profound story of three lonely individuals in a lonely and harsh terrain. So Carlos Fuentes was a very accomplished Mexican author and diplomat who was part of the Latin American boom, along with uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Mario Vargas Llosa, and uh, Julio Cortazar. And uh, was Juan Rulfo part of that? I don't know, actually. This article says he was a forerunner. Rulfo and Borges were, were before these guys. Fuentes himself was influenced by Cervantes, uh, Faulkner, and Balzac. Nice choices. 
He grew up in the United States, but uh, he visited Mexico in the summers. He used to go and visit his grandmothers, I think. I saw in an interview. I'll link to that below. I think it was with uh, Charlie Rose. He was also a diplomat, uh, an ambassador. It said on the back of this book that he lived in, in both uh, London and Mexico City, which is awesome. That is a fantastic uh, pair of cities in which to split your time. So he started writing this in 1964, but this wasn't published until 1985. So 21 years. You really feel that too, or at least I felt that I did, because it's like, as there are a lot of insightful lines that really feel like they're coming from somebody much older, somebody who's, who's lived, who's been around the block a few times. So it's as if he wrote the basic narrative when he was younger, you know, in the 60s. And then over the years, over the next couple of decades, uh, kind of just filled it in, explored and expanded and, and enriched it, basically, you know, with all this thought, you know, these, these really insightful ideas, you know, gave it depth throughout the coming decades. It really seemed to have the quality, uh, the wisdom of, of coming from someone much older than he was when he began, refining and refining, right? This was the first book written by a Mexican author to become a U.S. bestseller, so that's pretty cool. It's also about the shortcomings of the revolution and its uh, corrupt figures, notably in the book, Pancho Villa himself. It's about the disintegration of the revolution's principles. There are many similarities between Bierce and Arroyo. Bierce is fighting his father like Arroyo is fighting his. And Bierce even hallucinates when he's going into, you know, he's riding into the bullets of the enemy, the Federales. He hallucinates or, or he sees like the ghost of his father riding on, on top of the ridge or something like that on horseback. And I think he starts like shooting at him or something. And then of course Arroyo, you know, his father was a rapist. His father raped his mother and that's why he exists. He's forever fighting his father, the Miranda. That side of Arroyo's family stands for everything wrong with, with Mexico in his opinion, you know, which is why the revolution is taking place. So they are the kind of, they're the kind of emblem of the corrupt, the corrupt wealthy class that needs to be ousted. They both want to kill their fathers. And then you look at the revolution and you wonder the same thing. This human cycle of gaining power and killing those before you, only to be killed by your own children after you become stagnant and corrupted. Is that all this is? Was that the inevitable fate of the revolution in itself? I don't know. I haven't studied enough about it. I don't know the history of Pancho Villa in real life and what happened, but I'd like to. I'd, I definitely want to read more about uh, this period in history along the border and the revolution and all this stuff. If anybody has any recommendations, please leave a suggestion in the comment section below. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. So I'll leave you with that. You know, th uh, this is the setup. Uh, I won't spoil it. And the result is impressive, profound, uh, surprising in many cases, and ultimately absolutely worth your time, in my opinion. I now both want to read more Fuentes and Ambrose Beers, so. So what did I dislike? Hmm, what did I dislike? There were a few things. There are some kind of Hollywoodish moments in the book, right? That was where I was just kind of like, eh, you know. And there's a sort of like wise and wistful tone the author takes on, right? The tone of the aged, wise storyteller, which is contrived <laughs> and sticky at times, you know? Yeah, 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 it's the part of the book where you get to be poetic, right? We get it, you know, I, I got it. You could make the same argument for Cormac McCarthy. I think McCarthy just does it better. McCarthy's just a better writer, but that's just my opinion. Fighting words, potentially. Fuentes is, is good. Is it better than food? Not quite. It's good, but it isn't better than food. There are pages that just went on too long, in my opinion. I think it could have been tightened a little. So you should read it. Heart of Darkness, Blood Meridian, Pedro Paramo, 2666, Under the Volcano, the films Dead Man and Paris, Texas. If you like any of these things, I, I suggest you check it out immediately. I, and if you like this book, then I highly suggest you check out any of the aforementioned. I think they're all worth your time. I think they're all kind of living in this world and I think you'll enjoy. And if you don't, I can't help you. I listed them all below. There's affiliate links, so if you if you purchase them, then, then the show gets a kickback and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thank you very much for watching and stopping by. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show and I place their names in this now larger mason jar because there are more patrons. Thank you very much all the new patrons and the patrons who have come before and thank you to everybody. And I pull out a name for every review I do and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. Drinking the last of this delicious Ethiopian and I have a Rwandan on the way, so I can't wait to try it. Anyways, if you'd like to get into that, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food or click the link below and donate $5 or more per video. I sincerely appreciate it. If you donate $1 or more per video, you get access to these reviews ad free, the Discord channel, the Better Than Friday newsletter, which I send out every Friday, which is just a list of five different things that I'm interested in at any given time. Could be books in the pipeline, films, music, changes week to week. If you think we have similar tastes, I think you'll really enjoy that. Plus the Discord is just good for, you know, jokes and recommendations and memes. 
that's always good. Unfortunately, international shipping is not included. Sorry about that. This one is heavier. I'm really feeling it in like the, you know, the, the shoulder action there. I'm gonna get some, get some, yeah. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. <laughs> can really get my hand in there this time, yeah. David, David M. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate the support. You're going to receive The Old Gringo by Carlos Fuentes, plus a bag of delicious coffee. Please subscribe to the show if you haven't already and hit the thumbs up. It definitely helps the algorithm and I sincerely appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this. Please share it with somebody who you think would enjoy this book. And like Ambrose Bierce, die reading. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.